Hello, everyone. I'm Pinar Givanj, and welcome to What's Wrong with the Podcast. Today, we have the great pleasure of chatting with Joseph Heathcott. Joseph grew up in the industrial Midwest and has worked as a dishwasher, fry cook, roofer, carpenter, lumber, yard grunt, and community organizer. He also has a background as a photographer and radio announcer and producer. These days, he's the chair of urban and environmental studies at the New School, exploring cities within a global comparative perspective. Much of Joseph's work over the past decade has been to connect humanities and social sciences with practice fields such as architecture, planning, policy, and urban design. He is the author of Global Queens, and Urban Mosaic, which just came out. And with Angela Dietz, he wrote Capturing the City, photographs from streets of St. Louis. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Joseph Heathcott, who is a professor of urban studies at the New School. Uh, Joseph, I was very much looking forward to this conversation. I know we had a conversation before, which I wish I have recorded, um, but now we will be recording it. So welcome. Very, very nice to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> So please tell us about uh, yourself a little bit and your background and how you came to where you are today for our audience. Um, well, uh, I, I it depends on how far back you want me to go. But I mean, I think, you know, if, if there are certain important things about uh, my background that influence the work that I do, and I think one of the big ones is that um, I was raised in the uh, kind of industrial Midwest. Um, so sort of my background is shaped by growing up, uh, I say profoundly shaped by growing up in uh, uh, an aging, uh, old and rather polluted and, and dull uh, industrial city um, on the Ohio River in the Ohio River Valley. Um, and so that that sort of experience growing up, and, and in fact, it was it's called Evansville, Indiana, and it was named by um, Business Insider magazine as one of the ten most miserable places to live oh uh, in the United States. And so um, I, I, I sort of, I guess, I own that to a degree. Um, and uh, so my experience growing up there has sort of really shaped uh, how I think about cities and how I approach um, doing uh, urban work. Um, uh, you know, so for example, it's it's really shaped uh, my interest in the kind of the ordinary and mundane landscapes that we live with every day. Um, and a lot of my uh, research and uh, photography, art making is all sort of geared towards uh, the, the, the kind of urban mundane, the everyday life and everyday worlds of cities um, and how they're created. So uh, I grew up there and I went to college. Uh, I hitchhiked around the country and even around the world a bit. And uh, for a number of, of years, I lived in New York City. I trained as a community organizer. I worked as a community organizer. And then I eventually went to graduate school. Uh, and I got my PhD, uh, a dual PhD in American studies and history. Um, but I really focused on um, you know, architecture, landscape, uh, and urban studies. Uh, so that's a bit about my background. I mean, I, I taught in St. Louis for many years, and I, I came to the new school in 2007. Uh, so I've been there for about, I don't know, 15 or 16 years. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. But um, you basically, in all this like journey, you you're at the intersection of everything I love. Like oh, you, good. <laughs> you're, you're, you have studies around like cities. You also have done like community work and mm -hmm. understand how to organize communities and history. Right. And I think all of these all together, um, study together, make a city work. And mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, I feel like your like uh, experience already answers the problems we want to talk about. <laughs> but please, like, um, I think in in your work, um, especially work that you see that is done around urban design or urban planning, um, what are you seeing as some of like the shortcomings today? I mean, obviously, we could this conversation can change from country to country or city to city. Um, but maybe in terms of like practices, we can talk about more so than the wrongful outcomes. Uh, what are you seeing that we are uh, falling behind and why? Well, I mean, I think that's a, it, it's a really, um, yeah, of course, it's a complicated question, a complicated, complicated scenario. Uh, that, that's my answer. That's it. 
it's just complicated. <laughs> no, uh, highly uh, so, complex. Let's yeah, yeah highly complex. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that question. It's it's real. It is a, a crucial one, an important one, and. You know, one of the things I, I would say about um, urban planning and urban design uh, as, as their practice is, I don't think there's, I think we know a lot about what makes, you know, good urban planning, and good urban design. I don't think th those are necessarily mysterious. And I think we've learned a lot from past mistakes. I think the problem isn't so much that. The problem is that, you know, ur urban planners and urban designers have far less power than people think they do. Um, architects uh, also included in that. I think um, they are not uh, people who necessarily call the shots <laughs> in our society. They don't hold necessarily hold political power. Um, they are, you know, they're they're uh, subservient uh, to other kinds of interests. And you know, I think we know who those interests are. They're generally interests of you know global finance <laughs> and uh, um, you know the relentless uh, search of uh, by capital for investment opportunities around the globe um, that kind of powers the international financial system. Um, and I think, you know, planners uh, work and operate within that system. And and they, it, 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 certainly in the case of the United States, it's, you know, we don't have, um, we don't have a, a situation in which uh, they can usually implement the best ideas that come out of planning and design because cities are essentially run as uh, real estate operations, right? Uh, and real estate interests come first. And that's that I think I think to me that's the bigger problem um, that we face uh, today. It, it's not that I mean, of course, there are maybe things that can be improved, obviously, about about planning and design. But you know, to me, that's not the principal uh, problem. The principal problem is like who holds power and who has control over how decisions are made uh, in cities. Does that make sense? And yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I feel like um, it's 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 really interesting to me because in this like power dynamics right i feel like um yes i definitely agree and i also think within the power that we have could we actually push a bit further for uh, yeah. different practices because like if when you see that there may be like a little bit more power for let's say the architecture then which could result in statement architecture rather than something for the people too, right? So we also observe that. But I think you're right in the sense that like overall, the bigger problem here is is the power dynamics, which I want to like kind of like go back in time to kind of break that down. Was it mm -hmm. always like that? Because I feel like when you look into earlier like discussions in like urban design, architectural design, like uh, people in these fields were meant to be like kind of um, like the master master who would like lead us to like a great vision right and they it, it feels like that we like these disciplines had so much more power in the past mm -hmm. uh, what is this true or is this just the global myth and then if right. it is what happened well they i mean you know architects and planners had great power to the extent that they had powerful clients uh, right. So um, there's never a planner that goes off on her own or his own and and makes things happen. They are attached to clients uh, and their clients might be kings. <laughs> their clients might be dictators. Hi. Right. They're I mean, you know, my 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 favorite uh, uh, one of my favorite architects of all time is Mimar Sinan. And, you know, he he worked for, you know, a, a brutal authoritarian. <laughs> An empire, right? But he produced some of the most beautiful things uh, on earth. And so, you know, I mean, it, it's always, a, to me, it's a question of the, the, the who the client is and how the architect or planner is attached uh, to that powerful client. You think of Baron von Hausmann, right? You uh, attached to the emperor uh, in, in the second empire. You think of, uh, of Moses. Moses did consolidate some of a power base of his own, but couldn't really have done anything without the, the kind of assent of elected officials who were interested in the same kind of vision uh, and shared the vision that he brought um, to the table. It's not like he had some alternative vision that he forced on uh, New the New York power elite. I mean, they bought fully into it, right? Uh, if it wasn't Moses, it probably would have been someone else. So it to me, it's, it's, it's really always been a question of, who, you know, who controls the work of the planner and the architect. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I wish it would. I wish I could add more complexity to it, but I, I really feel it's actually a, a relatively straightforward no, uh, situation. Something we observe in like practice too. It is a common saying that you know you're only as good as your client. It typically right. comes up in like any project. And 
very much to your point, I think in history, we've seen tremendous work done, uh, maybe for the name sake of like religion or mm -hmm. for the sake of like a dictator wanting to just show power and show that he yeah, yeah. I, i'm not gonna right. say she because it was, yeah. it was a he. <laughs> of course <laughs> uh, he he was like in power and it was the most powerful and he could just do it right so it right. generally was um a, a, like even if we had realized a magnificent magnificent shift in something it was um, for the sake of like, again, maybe showing power yeah, or absolutely um, being a point, you know? And so in that sense, you made a really good point in terms of, um, you know, we, these professions are kind of in a crisis in a way because they don't have control of their own medium, right? Like they right. might be the experts and things that they're in, but they have no control over the final decisions, um, even like realization of things, right? Like we have like heavily relying on contractors, um, unions, um, engineers who want to do something or don't want to do something, right? So it's very much uh, requiring, um, I guess, like strategic collaboration as you're practicing whatever you're doing, because it actually does involve a lot of negotiation, convincing all parties and, um really troubleshooting uh, along the way, developing tactics in order to be able to realize a vision. And I think in addition to any project we're talking about for a city or building, um, this is the main project that we're not talking about, right? Like, and it's kind of like, the, should we change the entire way of like we're being educated in this field? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Um, no, that's absolutely but, right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And and there, you know, there are, of course, the, the breakthrough star architects that can sort of push the vision ahead. That's actually quite a rarity. Right. So the Zaha Hadid and, and Frank Gehry and, you know, I mean, they can push through. I mean, they have visions that people buy into because they're selling a particular kind of spectacle in the world. Right. And so people want that spectacle. But the ordinary kind of churn and burn of architecture in a global age is really meeting global uh, uh, performance uh, requirements set by financial uh, institutions and insurance, right? You have to meet those kind of portfolio requirements, and that yields a relatively bland and, you know, uh, really depressing yeah, yeah, <laughs> landscape. Exactly, like, exactly. You know. <laughs> I think, like, the, the star architects are kind of like the Chanel's of the fashion industry, right? Yeah. Like, I think um, that turns into more like consuming a luxury brand and yeah. Um, is it for the people really it's debatable right like it, to me they're like uh you know artistic like sculptures and yeah, it's yeah. fascinating right. and I'm fascinated by it but uh, are we really addressing the needs of a city that <laughs> that we can debate of course I mean yes. sure, yeah tourism boosting economy yeah all of those things like it can add into so many things but are, is it addressing any of the issues that we also want to address through urban design and um, just work in built environment. And on that, I also want to ask, so one side is like very much, you know, architects, uh, planners, uh, designers heavily relying on the client and the client typically also being uh, responsible to banks. So, right, like if we want to continue on that like chain, right. uh, they're right. operating on like loans from the banks and therefore have come to many like very low risk uh, benchmark decision making. Exactly. Yeah, which lacks innovation or innovative thinking. Um, what? How much do you think the responsibility? Not, I don't want to say responsibility, but more um, the reason uh, that we're also experiencing is, is, this is the lack of education in um, urban studies among the general public because. I want to say, for example, if you look at like a food industry or fashion industry, um, not that, you know, any innovation or shift happens very quickly and effectively and in an authentic way, right? There's greenwashing. We call <laughs> things that are organic that are not even organic, right? So there's like <laughs> so much like marketing, uh, just marketing happening. But in these industries, you immediately see an effort or even if it's fake, but, but like a um a showcasing of change or like responding to consumer demand because they are they are one of as some of the most relatable industries they are ones to show 
uh, consumers' interests also immediately, right? Like mm -hmm. if they're picking up on interests and in like more environmentally friendly materials, you would see it first in this industry. Whereas I feel like in built environment, even though it is a product for the people, right? Like, and it's like the number one priority to like shelter, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> very much our need. Um, I don't feel like an, an everyday user is in any way empowered in the decision making here more so than just like here are my options so i can go use these right there right. i feel like and do like how do you think this is also like is this why we're seeing so much power actually like uh, then ending up on the client side because there's basically not much power especially like i'm not even going to go into marginalized communities i'm just talking about like overall population because we're not seeing power on the cons consumption end, right? Like the consumer end. And has it always been like this? How is this evolving? I would love to get your thoughts on that. Right. I mean, that, that's I mean, that's exactly the question, right? And that's the question we all have to sort of think about and, and, and sit with and start to uh, figure out solutions for. And um, again, right, it is it is a client problem. Um, and architects, I think, and, and urban designers have a lot to gain by making allies with ordinary citizens, right, uh, to push for uh, better design, to push for better planned uh, communities, to push for better uh, ar and more responsive architectural solutions. Um, and this, you know, it's it's a matter of defining the public good, right? And we've surrendered the public good to market forces in, in much of our society. And so if you surrender that to market forces, then, of course, markets controlled by financial institutions, uh, insurance, banks, uh, real estate investors, et cetera, are going to call the shots, right? Um, so there have been moments in, in, in history, maybe in the past 100, 150 years, where you've been able to expand how people think about the public good, right? So one of those moments, of course, was in the Great Depression uh, under the New Deal. And you saw a building a, a building and design program under the WPA and other, other projects, the Tennessee Valley Authority and so forth, that really took the public good to heart uh, and employed, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands of architects and urban planners in, in creating really fantastic things, right? Um, you know, uh, electrification projects for entire regions, uh, which were, I think, desperately wanted or needed um, uh, in New York City, right? Swimming pools, right? Beaches, like right. Uh, um, schools, building post offices, like all hospitals, all these institutions with really, really good design ideas at the heart of of them for ordinary people in the general public sphere, right? Uh, and that had that sort of has closed down, right? And so we've surrendered so much to the market. Even even thinking of people as consumers first rather than citizens is part of the problem, right? So we're housing consumers, not citizens who live in a city right. who need somewhere to live, right? And that that sort of framing of us as end user consumers, I think um, in, in so many ways kind of negates our political power, right? It reduces us to economic ciphers uh, in a market situation. And that's what we have to fight against. And I think architects and planners have to be part of that fight. Uh, be, you know, be to, to, in other words, it, to create a new client, which is people, right? the, you know, people with, uh, with enough power uh, and enough uh, financial uh, worth, maybe through government or other kinds of institutions, the problem is we don't have a lot of media and institutions that can do this in the United States, at least. Um, um, I often look at the model of uh, what happened in the Netherlands, right? I mean, I mean, not, we don't always need to look to other places necessarily for the best ideas, but no, you know, in the Netherlands, there was this amazing sort of um, middle tier of institutions like mutual housing associations, right? And they worked closely with with the the Dutch state uh, uh, to uh, be the kind of mediator between the needs of uh, ordinary citizens for good housing uh, and the the state, which had the kind of political authority uh, to uh, sort of uh, plan, uh, to mandate, to shape space, uh, and the financial uh, power, right, from taxation and so forth. And the mutual housing associations were there to create really good housing, and they did that, right? So we don't have anything right. like that in, in the U.S., except for a few scattered little cooperatives and community land trusts and stuff, which, you know, of course, I, I feel like we really need to explode outward and build up. But um, we we have so few of those. Uh, it's just really this kind of private transactional system between individual buyers, you know, buying individual property in a market system, which makes right. us just consumers of space, right? Right.
Right, right, right. Yeah. And I think in that process, there are very ineffective measures being taken, like community board hearings or yeah. some community hearings where like people express their frustrations and needs and then it's all noted down to right. never be looked at again. Right. <laughs> and it's well, kind of and- like and yeah. neighborhood associations right the the housing associations you know that control like what color your your you know uh uh your facade is you know and <laughs> yeah. how many rocks you can have on your property i don't know whatever you know you know you get the idea right uh, which yeah. are you're completely sort of, sort of these weird bizarre consumer uh oriented um entities right that are about property values rather than citizenship right <laughs> right. right so true and I think there is, you know, in RFPs going out today, for example, I feel like we're seeing more um, requests for like community engagement, Mm -hmm. right? Even though it's like very vague how it's presented. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I feel like, and I would love to get your thoughts on that, like any studio doing work in like architectural or urban design space has the responsibility to define methodologies and practices of what that should look like because this is like something we talk about as sour often like we're almost like let's not say collaboration anymore because it's so vague and we don't even know what we mean right so how what does that mean and how do we define that and what does that look in our design or like project process right like how does it go into the scope of work and I think that is our responsibility. And the more we don't do that, the more we are um, actually hurting ourselves by like not having any like uh, control over this like, you know, process, right? Like we're just then like these service providers trying to please a client. Um, And if we could still do that, but at least we could also remember that there are multiple stakeholders that we need to please, right? And not necessarily yeah. only only the client. And this, like, I, I still see, like, for example, we practice co-design methods regardless mm-hmm. of what type of project we work on, right? And I still see when I talk about, for example, co-design at an event or like a speaking engagement, especially when the audience is majority architects, right? Um, I don't get a response or um i get a response like but we're the experts right like as if i'm suggesting like everyone to have a jam session on rhino and like 3d model together right like not necessarily i don't know if we don't understand that design is a process and Mm -hmm. people are involved in the process or what is the mindset here that is kind of like is really creating our own blockage to like move move towards this right and so yeah i would love to get your thoughts on this like mindset and attitude that exists in this space well i mean there's there's such a great uh set of of observations and questions so um you know i think there's a few ways to sort of tackle that and one is that to say that um I, I don't have any problem whatsoever with expertise, right? I, we want experts in the world, right? Uh, I actually love that when I drive over a bridge, it was created by engineers rather than history majors, right? <laughs> uh, that actually fills me with confidence. You know, if if I had designed a bridge, God God help us. Uh, so I actually like that, right? When I go to the the, the doctor, I'm really happy they have a, a, a medical degree. You know, that, that actually is pretty nice. Um, the problem is the political the political economy of expertise, right? The political economy within which expertise is deployed, and, and that is to me that's the problem. And also, um, you know, the the scare the the scarcity principles that operate within that political economy, so that there's gatekeeping functions that you know uh, professional uh, uh, credentialing associated, all those things are good, but they they create a scarcity. Uh, in in expertise, and so that experts themselves have to sort of constantly defend their territory, have to constantly work, uh, you know, to promote themselves and their disciplines. And I think architects have, and and maybe planners to some extent, but certainly architects have always always felt that. And I I feel like they've long felt, um, in some ways, uh, like they're they've been bypassed by the engineers of the world and the you know the uh, the 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 high tech designers and you know all this kind of stuff. But I think the the better idea is 
is to go low tech, not high tech. It's to go go into communities to for architects and planners to really see themselves as citizens first and allies, right, of of communities, uh, and and to be really working for public goods, right, and and in in what they do, uh, and that's that's a that, that's a way that you know I, I think communities want experts. It's not like they don't want expertise. The question is how do experts relate to the communities in which. Uh, they're either embedded or with whom they're working, right? To me, that's a that that that's kind of the heart of uh, of of the question. And there's all kinds of community engagement. There's all kinds of participation, um, you know. But I I I sometimes look at um, participatory budgeting as the as as a kind of uh, um, a, a cautionary tale for this, right? I mean, if you right. think about participatory budgeting, which is a great idea, of course, um, it's generally participation in the decision over crumbs, right? Uh, it's not that uh, New York City says, okay, we have participatory budgeting and everyone comes together and we have this number of billions of dollars and we decide what to do with it. This amount for police, this for education, this for, and this is how we spend it on police, by the way. <laughs> you know, um, instead of tanks, maybe we, uh, you know, yeah. have more social workers, you know, et cetera. You get the idea. Instead, it's like, here's the budget and here's a bit of here's a few crumbs left over and that's what we're actually arguing over right for participatory budgeting uh, and i think the same goes for any kind of participation process where do where do people come into the process right are they there to formulate the basis of decisions the platform for making um connections with one another and decisions, or are they there to sort of uh, confirm uh, or even sort of launder decisions that have already been made in advance uh, by more powerful interests? And to me, that's the that's the key question about participation and community engagement. Where are they engaging? At what stage? How much scope do they have uh, uh, right. uh, in terms of input in a, in a given project? Which the, you know, the mind blowing part of that is like, that is expertise, knowing when that could happen and being able to like uh, customize that based on the community's need and understand and even like synthesizing what's coming in right like those are all expertise that I, I like are we forgetting those are expertise or like are we or don't we don't value them as much so that we feel you know that maybe like a co-design process diminishes our expertise in some way because I also see you know, like we're involved in um in this like project on a the the redesign of the earthquake region in like Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. And there are multiple firms, multiple firms are involved. Um, and I like we did not feel comfortable starting the process without interviewing people, right? And like we wanted to do field research. We went in there and we uh, had like o over 50 interviews and out of those like who we interviewed now we're identifying a co-creation panel so we can invite those people into the process uh, later on in the project too and it's and these are like um, international firms local firms mix of like 10 firms leading this project and I it was m mind-boggling to see like uh, a lot of the design work started before that field research Right. And so I don't know if this goes back to the education of the practice or what we see, what we think the practice is, but research, validating assumptions, generating insights to inform design feels like quite a universal <laughs> need, regardless of the design field. Um, and so where did like is this also kind of like uh the economy the client the push kind of had us erode that process out of like architecture urban design um how like was it always like this is it is this related to how we're educated in college uh i would love to get your thoughts on that well, uh, yes to all of the above <laughs> right i mean i think you 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 sort of uh, hit the nail on the head there. I mean, it's it is partly about how um, how design is conceptualized, 
right? Um, we, we forget the design is actually a, a, a neurocognitive affordance that every human being carries with them in their brain, right? That is what design, I mean, design is, you know, seeing the arrowhead and the rock, right? And be able to predict a future of, if I chip this rock away, I'll get an arrowhead and I can use that to, you know, hunt an animal and feed, <laughs> feed myself, right? That's design, right? And so uh, everyone has the neurocognitive capacity for design. The question is, uh, you know, to, to what extent um, are uh, experts uh, trained to see that potential in everybody, right? To see the potential to uh, contribute something meaningful uh, to a design process or design outcome, right? Uh, and to do so from the very beginning, right? That's the, as you said, you, you mentioned this, right? This happens in disasters all the time when well, you know, when there's an earthquake or, or, or a hurricane or something, uh, the design work is already going on before anyone is even consulted. Uh, and really what's happening is the financial packages are already being put together, right? Even before the design work, right? And so, so you've got this kind of layered tier of things going on in which communities, public good, uh, and the, the needs of people are sort of the last thing to be brought into the into the process, and that's that that you know that's a recipe for uh, doing this thing over and over again, the same old business over and over again. Um, yeah, and I think you know um, there are various examples. Also, like I can think of like this in like practice, like this is ha this is happening, and I'm curious to know you know what like have you seen examples from like the history or maybe like in other countries where there has been like significant uh change in like mindset of like architects or you know it like in certain projects right uh where this was like very much the priority right like un the understanding that we're serving people and that also reflected as an outcome. I know you gave the example of like Netherlands and what hap what has happened there, but do you see other examples from history or today um, where there were like real successful examples of, um, no, like we understand, you know, this is our responsibility as like architects and designers and uh, hence the process. Well, I mean, yes, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of examples of that all over the world, but I think there are small examples, right? They're they're tiny, and um, that's that's always the problem. Is that we, we I, th I feel like one of the things we do is we look to uh, solutions in these really small moments, and that's not a bad thing. I, I don't want to say that's bad, um, but the problem is uh, this is it's a it's a scalar challenge right it, it's like how what are the kind of mediating institutions or senses of geography and space uh the political uh uh political organization that is going to help scale up uh good ideas i think there's a, a million good ideas and and thousands of good projects at a very small level and right. i think that uh, the architects and, and planners other people involved in design industries could really help in thinking about um the kind of uh, the intermediating scales as part of the design problem, right? That that is, how do we create uh, ways in which good ideas can actually bubble up institutionally uh, um, and structurally, right? That's the challenge. The challenge. I I think there's, you know, there's no end of good ideas, <laughs> right? Uh, I I don't I don't even see that as the problem. It, it it's it's all it to me the the constant challenge is a it's scalar and it's it's power, right? I mean, how do you scale things up uh, in, in, in how do you challenge the, the power structures that reduce all of us to uh, end users and consumers, um, disempower communities and so on, right? I, so I'm not trying to evade the question. It's just that I look at the, I look at the issue from a different sort of perspective. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. And I think to that point, like a hypothesis that we have is that the, methods are scalable right how you customize yeah. those methods or like make it authentic to the process or to the community could evolve and maybe that requires expertise or a certain level of like experience practicing it simply to be able yeah. to understand the nuances um well listening is a, a great expertise like <laughs> it, it's 
you know, no, no joke. I mean, you know, like, like architects and planners learning to listen, and I mean, authentically listen, uh, and understand uh, communities and people's needs and community needs, by the way, may be really, really uh, complicated and messy and, um, you know, never resolved, never resolvable, right? They may be right. always agonistic and in contradiction and contradistinction. But, you know, there's their understanding that there are, that there's a process between listening and translation and and um, you know making sure people are understood into the design the the sort of traditional design process which is like drawing things and building things right. Right? Yeah. right right I love that I think I I think in any problem of the world if we start with like better active listening um, to each other we could like advance so much more and we're so ready to just like share our uh expert thought and yeah. or um wait our turn to speak i think that is like getting in the way of uh most design innovation in any absolutely field. absolutely it's financial institutions you know i mean they don't care what you think right <laughs> they it, and no, they just don't they'll never they'll never care i mean deutsche bank might have some employee that goes out and says we care about you but that they ultimately they don't care right what they care about is is return on investment and shareholder value right okay. and so those are the things that power their decisions bar none uh if if your good ideas fit into their financial portfolio so much the better but if they don't too bad <laughs> you know and so it takes a it, it'll take a different kind of politics right i mean architects and planners who want to have a world that looks like this have to fight for it you know with with everybody right uh, and and be citizens <laughs> and activists 100 percent, and also recognizing the um, domain we're operating in, right? So if this is our reality, right? If most of our design decisions are gonna be um, uh, finalized uh, by ROI, then um, what can we do within time and budget? What is feasible and viable today? So we could create small prototypes and build successful benchmarks because in the end it's also an industry that benchmarks a lot from one another right yeah it's right. already problematic because like the project timeline is so long and by the time a project is realized is very likely to be obsolete in the current methodologies we have and then we're still benchmarking those which is why one of the reasons the industry itself is like so far behind um and especially becoming more of a bigger problem when we live in such a volatile and uncertain yeah. environment. And, but if we can kind of incorporate small wins into everything, and if that becomes more like a global benchmark, but to your point, this can't happen. Like there are exactly to your point, like many uh, success stories all around that are small, like case studies. Yeah. Um, but if we don't collectively shift on like shift how we work, um, and incorporating the mindset of almost like tech industry a little bit, like let's do a beta version of this. And this is not hurting anybody in terms of time and budget. So let's start with this and see how this works. And then maybe we go to this next and maybe if we prove that successful, right? Like kind of almost like an innovation roadmap, right? We, we're right. not going to get there immediately, clearly, yeah. especially in this like system we're trying to operate in. Um, but how do we kind of push a little bit like that bottom up change like in the end whether that's like climate whether that's like equitable spaces there might be a regulation that's going to determine um you know the client to shift their needs right right but until we instead of like waiting for that to come what what can we do for that like bottom up push even if there are these like micro advancements into our own process and i feel like that's the responsibility of anyone practicing in this space or anyone generally right i mean all of us <laughs> generally uh, you know part part of it is, right is is exactly you know you know pushing um to to see in, in 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 other words if you think of design as uh if you want to see design have an outcome in the public good then the public good has to be funded Right. And right now we fund the public good through the market, essentially. I mean, there was that time and I mentioned the New Deal when there's a, a massive expansion of the role of government and lots of money for architects and designers to really think in creative and interesting ways that slams shut. Let's open that up again. 
right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's going to take a real change in how we think about the federal budget, for example, right? I mean, how like people always say, well, there's no money for that. People, I mean, I I hear that all the time. There's no money for better design. I'm like, well, you know, we spend billions of dollars on weapons of mass destruction, right? There's plenty of money. <laughs> it's just yeah, what we decide to spend. Problem. on. It's, the it's not the problem. Stuff. Exactly. It's how we have apportioned it in this system and what what the slivers of public good actually are in that in that budget. Budget, as Saul Linsky said, budgets are moral documents, right? They're they're fingerprints about the moral uh, decisions that you're making as a society. And we've made the decision to uh, focus primarily on military, police, surveillance, global power, all those things that, you know, I, I think are going to be, uh, unless we stop that cycle and rethink how our, our money is used, then that's, you know, so that's one area for pushing. The other is, you know, architects, I think, often talk about scale and they're, they're, they're not good scale jumpers and neither are planners and others because we're either talking about little experiments that need to bubble up or talking about the globe. Right mm -hmm. and and or the nation state or whatever, but there's to me the, the the key scale is the region, and and I and I think especially bioregions, right? That is where we can really start to think creatively about you know how architects and planners and designers can actually come together uh, around um, principles of good you know, public good oriented design is at the regional scale. And what are the kind of intermediate institutions that can perhaps operate at that scale? Uh, you know, and that's to me, that's a that's a really that's a whole area uh, of work that that uh, is sort of waiting for us. I mean, we don't have politically, it's difficult because in the United States, we either have the, the federal government or we have states and we have cities that are creatures of state governments, but we don't have any political entities that are really kind of regional authorities of one kind or another. There's a few of them, like like the Port Authority, right? That's a, that's right. a, a bi-state authority. Uh, or tri-state, I'm not really sure, but um, so, uh, but we need, but we need much more of that, and and that is one scale at which I think architects and urban designers and urban planners can really operate creatively, um, and and more so even than at the, the kind of local scale, and and certainly the global scale. I don't even understand what that means. So, does right. that make sense, or do, do you see it that way, or do you uh, do you have another idea about? scale <laughs> i don't have any ideas <laughs> well i mean <laughs> i feel like well de definitely i think i mean in the end it does not work if we try to operate in silos right and we're already like so project focused like singular like with our right. own team and um then we're just like multiple projects next to each other without any connective tissue and that's where you see like number one neighborhoods are hurting and then cities are hurting and then um i mean we in new york city we see that right we see these like great projects happening typically very high end so it's like it would have models like people first but it's people first only if you have this income level right like right. It's kind of, so um and I think we understand as a country who like very much is built on the American dream and being like inviting to, um, you know, foreigners, immigrants. Um, we understand that culture making is very important and mm -hmm. having these like cities, uh, unique experiences is very important. And I feel like this current system that we're in is only creating this homogeneous way of producing and we're losing that interesting aspect of our yeah. city and you know there was this like movie i can't remember which one but the guy was saying like the most exciting neighborhood of new york city is philadelphia <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> is, I mean but like like when you look at manhattan and like everything being like franchise and corporate like yeah. you're kind of like seeing that happening right yeah, it's a, it's home for stockbrokers and tech bros and stuff like that. i mean i live I in queens i mean I'm, I'm here in jackson heights queens so you know <laughs> but we, see, we saw the impact of the pandemic hit manhattan most like severely because it no longer has communities the neighborhoods, the locals who care about staying there. That's right? right. Whereas like Brooklyn was not as bad, but I think Brooklyn is going through a Manhattanization, which, you know, it will slowly get there. Um, and so in that sense, like what you're saying is almost like 
to me, we have to operate in like clusters in this and like regions, like to me, can the, be those like clusters mm -hmm. and very multidisciplinary cult cluster Absolutely. Yeah. to make this happen, to lobby if we have to, right? Like to kind of even have mm -hmm. more power in what we're doing than this like only one like arch architecture or like design firm trying to like advocate for one project to one client, which is inefficient. I mean, yes, you can still aim to do the best you can within your domain. Um, but if we really want to see that scalable shift and have like a roadmap of like change, this has to happen way more like collectively. And I think what that collective means, what collaboration means yeah. in that region, we really need to like define that. So I'm really understanding that from what you're saying. And it makes absolutely. Sense. I think another uh, so so hundred percent uh, agree that I think you you said it much better than I did, and I think another area that you know architects and designers could be really uh, really helpful in is is really in helping to sort of reshape the the content of our dreams. You you can dream right, and the American dream was really based on the notion of uh, of property ownership. Right, and the and, and especially uh, the ownership of of a house on its own grounds, right, and that's a that's a that's a reasonable aspiration for any individual or family, right. The problem is that the sum total of of rational choices does not necessarily make a rational society, right? If we all want five cars or if we all want a giant house, um, that may be rational for one individual. But if you put if you add that up with 300 million people, it's a disaster. And so um, it's it's the content of our dreams as much as it is the political economies in which these dreams unfold, right? Uh, um, you know, I think of the I, I I think of the case study house program as a good example of this, right? I mean, uh, the case study house uh, uh, program, you know, showcased um, a, a incredible designs uh, for kind of ordinary uh, houses by a wide range of the best architects of the time, you know, Arosarin and and so forth, Mies van der Rohe, whatever, and and then, um, you know, so these could have been available for, you know, people in suburbs all over the United States, right? But what happens, of course, is the Federal Housing Administration comes and says, no, we are only going to back the mortgages of Cape Cod's ranch houses and maybe split levels. And that's it, right? And so, voila. <laughs> so so people get their dream they get the property and, and but then, but then what they get is this kind of bland landscape of exactly as you said earlier this homogenized so uh you know sort of production of, at the large scale uh of this dream right and and you know how our dreams translate into reality is often very complicated and, and this is this is exactly where designers could help us see different visions right of the future right to see to imagine other ways of being in the world other ways of living on the land right these are all things that we have to really reconceptualize to to live well and dwell well uh, on the planet yeah on that i and i would love for you to like cover this for our like audience too i, I remember in our last ch uh, chat i was uh, bringing up to you like oh yeah like one time we interviewed this environmental psychologist and she was telling us like in 1970s architectural psychology was a big term mm -hmm. and i was kind of like what happened and you you told me 80s happened and i would love for you to like expand that a little bit for our audience too because i think it's like fascinating well, I think I think there was this moment um, in architecture that's really exciting, uh, and it's really the you know the mid '60s to the late '70s, right? This period when you have Archigram and you know you have uh, 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 Venturi and, and and Scott Brown, like you you have Peter Rao, you have all these thinkers and all this firmament and energy uh, being devoted towards really ordinary things, uh, towards again towards the dreams we have about the world, uh, towards you know dwelling. And in, in place, like all this richness bubbling up uh, in firmament and architecture and design. And then, you know, if, when I say the 80s happen, I mean the real estate booms, right? The, the, the kind of uh, booms where global finance really took over 
uh, the the kind of building and development process, right? That is, uh, in order to get loans, you had to meet certain risk uh, performance portfolios. And that's exactly, to, to my mind, that's what happened. Architecture uh, really, at least certainly in, in the educational side of things, really devoted itself towards that, right? The client became uh, the, the, the fire, uh, the fire industries, right? The, the, the fire uh, economy. And, and that firmament sort of disappeared. That, that stuff that bubbled up in the seventies uh, just kind of went away, um, you know? Yeah. And I think our prompt today then like also to wrap up our like conversation now, what, like over like 50 years like later, um, what are we doing today knowing that we are operating in this like finance dominance realm, right? And everything that we're putting out there will have will be put to test by like feasibility, viability, scale. And so knowing that, how do we really first like redefine our dreams to your, exactly to your point and then um, know who to work with and how to yeah, work with them. Right. Um, in those like clusters or regions, as you mentioned, and then um, really kind of un like going back to the basics in terms of like listening, starting off with everything that listening, if it's not working, if we have an excuse to not work it in our timeline to learn to make it work, right? Like, I think we really need to kind of get out of our comfort zone and how we've been like practicing too, if we haven't been doing this. So I think those are a few like actionable things um, to help us like feel a bit more empowered and in a, a system where we feel a little bit, uh, you know, um, with lack of power and like yeah. in defense mode. Um, but yeah, I think that's like what I'm like hearing from the conversation. And I do want to be mindful of our time. I know I can talk to you like forever, <laughs> Joseph, this our last call. Um, but I do want to ask uh, uh, like your thoughts on or advice uh, for anyone who is going um, into maybe urban studies, uh, who wants to push for change, who wants to like really expedite action too, given, you know, now we have like climate urgency and things like that. So how do we, what, what would be your advice to anyone who really wants to um, yeah. take things up? <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there's a, that that's a great question, honestly, and and um, I think this is we talk about this a lot, actually, my colleagues and I. And to me, there's there's a, there's a million good vectors, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. Like that's to me, that's not the issue. Like there's lots of ways you can join community organizations. You can you can you become an organizer. You can push for things. You can become politically active in this or that or other. To me, that's not uh, the issue. The issue is to go into the world thinking of yourself first as a participant in the world or thinking of it first as a as a citizen right of the world or of the city right nation state whatever but certainly of the city that you live in certainly uh, uh, a citizen and, and you know just a member of the public right someone who's part of and has a stake in this the same kind of city that everyone else is living in uh, you know architects also live in cities planners also live in cities right uh, they're not they're not separate from those things um, and so see yourself as an entangled with other people in the in this work um and uh to me that's that's far more important is to how you think about your own sort of uh, place in the world right you're you're not the expert who knows everything uh and don't think of yourself as a consumer first or see others as consumers right see people as politically complicated and tangled and messy and all that stuff and that's the world you're leaping into and uh to me and then you can figure things out i mean there's a lots of things you can do right uh that's not the hard part the hard part is 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 up here right is, right, is, right. is reframing how we approach the Amazing. world yeah, starting off with the mindset and attitude about things and then going about defining the methodology and practice underneath. But yeah. I love that. Like, and I know, and I'll do a quick shout out to one of your classes. I know you mentioned to me, like one of your first assignments to your students is to have them like go sit in a neighborhood. And um, if I remember correctly, like Union Square, for example, in like Manhattan and just like observe people watching without any talking and all yeah. they just sitting there. And I think- those type of like observations and research is very, very effective and profound for the design process that we yeah. skip very often. Um, but I think we need to like re 
like teach ourselves to like practice those within our our, uh, projects and practices as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to be able to sit in in spaces and just think and see, you know, and, and have, you know, activate our senses in the world. Um, You know, that that's crucial. That's crucial. And that's hard for people to do in a distracted world. Right. Yes. The more the reason why we need to do it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) This was amazing. I know oh, good. I you all day, but we got to, I want to be conscious of your time. Thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure. It's, it's great talking to you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for all the great questions and ideas. <laughs> Thanks for all the responses. Have a great one. Okay, you too. Goodbye. <laughs> And that is this week's episode of What's Wrong With The Podcast. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcasting platform. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Links can be found in the episode description, and you can also find them on our website, podcast.whatswrongwith.xyz. If you found value in the show, we would appreciate if you could rate us and leave a review, or you can simply tell your friends about us. For more details on our guests, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Don't forget to join us next week. Thank you for listening.